Hi, welcome to Fertility Talks. I'm your host, Mary Wong, doctor of traditional Chinese medicine and acupuncturist, founder of Alive Holistic Health Clinic, author of Pathways to Pregnancy, and your life and fertility coach. Tonight, I'm so excited to be talking about endometrial receptivity, ACA, meaning we're talking about the uterine lining and its importance for implantation. And with us tonight, we have a very special guest. So I wanna really thank you for taking your time out in, at your home, on your spare time, <laughs> to be with us tonight. Thank you, Tiffany. Well, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be a part of this. Well, it'll be a great conversation because this is a topic of debate and people ask me every single day about the endometrium and about IVF. So uh, before we dig deep, I just wanna introduce everyone to who you actually are. So Tiffany, I'm sorry, how do I pronounce your last name? Uh, it's Dan Kevich. I was gonna say that, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Tiffany Stankovich uh, earned her bachelor's degree in animals bioscience from the Pennsylvania State University and is currently pursuing her PhD in genetics at the University of Kent. Now, uh, Tiffany has also had 10 years of being a clinical embryologist, board certified embryologist, and she has joined um, iGenomix starting in 2016, where her primary focus is on the endometrial receptivity analysis test, which is ERA. And um, as an endometrial specialist, she assists with technical and clinical aspects of the test, coordinates research projects and participates in publications. So again, thank you for being here. And I just wanna get dig right into our topic because again, it's so important and it's very hot on the press right now too. Uh, so very first of all, what the heck is it? And what is the endometrium and what is its role in pregnancy? So the endometrium is very important in, in pregnancy. So it's the location of where the embryo is going to implant and where the fetus is going to grow throughout the pregnancy. So you can see how just essential it is to, to success of, of, of not only implantation, but pregnancy itself. Um, so you can, I'll let you go from there. Well, so then because the endometrial is definitely involved with the actual implantation, so what is endometrial receptivity? And then this whole talk about window of implantation. Sure, so endometrial receptivity is when the endometrium is ready to accept an embryo for implantation. So receptivity um, must be there in order for successful implantation to even occur. And what the window of implantation is, that's defined as the, the amount of time or the, exactly when the embryo, uh, endometrium is, is ready for implantation. And what we know is that, um, first of all, there's a whole sequence of events that occur in order for endometrial receptivity to, to be obtained. Um, this includes uh, certain genes that must be turned on in order for certain events to occur. But looking exactly at the window of implantation, we know that it can differ in women. So not only of when it occurs in their cycle, but actually how long in duration that window is open for. So we've seen women with window implantations as short as 12 hours. Um, and then some women have window implantations as long as 48 hours. So again, not only is it important to identify where the window implantation lies within the cycle, but we also um, you know, need to consider the duration of the patient's window implantation. And again, the importance of this is, this is the time when the embryo can have the ability to implant into the uterus. So, if you transfer a perfectly perfect embryo into an endometrium that's not receptive, unfortunately, it's not going to implant and um, you won't start the pregnancy. So then I have a question then. Um, so when I did my IVF cycle, well, multiple times, but the one that worked, um, it was a frozen embryo transfer. And as you know, when they do that, um, when they, uh, what I call hijack my body, and they don't even let me ovulate and they use estrace like an estrogen and then um, basically not let me ovulate and then produce the lining from that um, methodology does it take away from the window of receptivity like is there 
is the implantation window longer because you're using drugs to create this um, lining? Do you get what I'm saying? So uh, not necessarily. And, and what is, um, I guess, very special about endometrial receptivity is that it's so personalized. So as I mentioned before, you know, where the window of implantation lies depends upon each woman herself. So perhaps my window of implantation is five full days of progesterone exposure. So as you were referring to in a, in a hormone replacement therapy cycle, where you undergo estrogen and then you're given um, exogenous progesterone, um, yeah. you know, again, typically we would expect this to be found about five days after progesterone starts. Right. But not every patient is going to be receptive at that time. And that's what we're finding out with the ERA test. So we would expect the majority of patients to actually be receptive with your typical, you know, frozen embryo transfer sting, or cycle, um, right. again, five days after progesterone exposure. But what we know now, about one um, in, in three patients actually have a, a displaced window of implantation where, you know, they're not going to be receptive after that typical um, cycle that you're undergoing. So maybe they need less progesterone exposure time, or maybe they need more progesterone exposure time in order to achieve the window of implantation. Okay, so then that means, so just to go through the actual testing procedure, um, um, from what I know is then you would actually do this. Oh, what exactly do you do for ERA? So that's a really good question. <laughs> so um, the ERA test is intended for patients who are undergoing a frozen embryo transfer cycle. So that's that's kind of the, the first um, thing to keep in mind. So these are for patients who have frozen embryo transfers. And we're just looking to see when's the best time in order for the endometrium to be in synchrony with the embryo or the embryo to be in synchrony with the endometrium. So what patients will do, they'll undergo what we refer to as ERA mock cycle. So you pretty much will do the, everything the same as you would in the frozen embryo transfer cycle, except instead of transferring the embryo, your physician's going to take an embryo biopsy. So as I mentioned in say hormone replacement therapy cycle, you'll take your estrogen for anywhere from about you know, seven days or, or up to two weeks. And then your physician will start on your exogenous progesterone supplementation. And approximately five days after starting your progesterone, the physician will go in, perform uh, endometrial biopsy, will receive the endometrial biopsy of iGenomics. And at that point, um, we'll go ahead and we perform next generation sequencing on that sample. And essentially what we're looking for is to see what genes are turned on and turned off because we've associated specific genes and their expression to you know a receptive endometrium and specific genes and their expression to a non-receptive endometrium so we look at each patient's um, uh, sample and we can say okay yes because these specific genes are turned on this patient is found receptive however in this patient these specific genes are turned on which indicates she's non-receptive. And in those cases, we can give a recommendation for what we refer to as a personalized embryo transfer. And what this may mean is that the patient, uh, we might come around and say, okay, you need 12 hours more of progesterone exposure in order to reach that receptive phase. Um, so it, it's, again, it's the epitome of, of personalized, um, uh, personalized uh, medicine as far as the endometrium receptivity goes. Right. So, and this is beyond the thickness of the lining, right? Because traditionally, you just solely base it on, okay, you've got eight millimeters, uh, you're good to go, right? You're absolutely correct. So, you know, we're, we're taking it one step further and we're actually looking at the genetics of the endometrium and using a, a molecular test, which it tends to be, you know, overall. For, for any test a little bit more reliable than just say visually looking at something since so there is an aspect of you know subjectivity to that. So because you say you know one in three may have a displaced um, uterine lining receptivity so are there cases where you say hands down this is really important for someone to um, use as a test or are there cases where you think you know what it's not necessary? So at this point in time, based upon the research we've performed and the clinical trials that, that we have, um, the ERI test is intended for those patients with reoccurring implantation failure. So 
So that's, you know, one or two failed embryo transfers were good quality embryos. And what we found, again, in that population about, you know, as I mentioned, one in three of these patients are going to have a displaced one of implantation. What's interesting, uh, we had a, a, a clinical trial several years ago in specifically those patients with rape current implantation failure. So these are patients with four, five, six, you know, failed implantations after IVF. And when we essentially, you know, quote unquote, fixed their, their um, I guess, IVF cycles and, and accounted for the displaced window of implantation, their pregnancy and implantation rates return to what we normally would see in those patients who don't have recurrent implantation failure. So what this tells us is that this asynchrony between the blastocyst and endometrium may be a reason why these patients are suffering over and over from failed implantation and, and could be the answer they're looking for. Now, whether or not that this indication will be expanded, we have yet to see. Um, one thing that I genuinely certainly pride myself in is that uh, we are heavily invested in research. So we have over 30 people in our, com in our company just dedicated to research and development. So there is um, a, a trial that we're finishing up at this point where we look at the, the utilization of ERA in, in the, your everyday first-time IVF patient without a history of late-term implantation failure. Okay, so, right. So that's what I want to know. It's like, do you still use it just for first-timers? But, you know, I, I do have a little concern because, you know, for those that actually don't have an implantation issue, and then sometimes it's literally just egg, like even when the um, embryo has been tested and it's um, chromosomally normal, like literally sometimes I don't believe that it's still necessarily a baby, right? Like it's not so, nothing is a hundred percent. And I don't think that this is a hundred percent. You might be biased because you work for the company, <laughs> <laughs> but um, like I, I mentioned, and I had, for example, a patient who is now currently very pregnant. I thought this was interesting. She says, Oh gosh, like I'm, I'm Jewish. And you know, I have this, that to date for embryo transfer, but you know, do you think it's okay for me to push it to this auspicious date? So I thought, well, you know, if it's if you're looking at ERA, they might say no, but you're not doing testing, and she didn't want to test. I said, well, I don't like. I mean, you have to be comfortable with your choice. So in the end, she opted to ch uh, choose the auspicious date, which was like four days after the recommended time, and she's currently pregnant like at least 24 weeks in so wow that's amazing right so to me it's like well i don't think it has to be for everyone but how do you do really discern yeah and i i think i absolutely agree with you i think that you know as i mentioned if you ask us we say okay our indication is for patients with current implantation failure and even looking at that study where we're, we're testing in, in your everyday first-time IVF patients without a history of implantation failure, we found that approximately one out of six of these patients had a history of implantation. Sorry, um, hang on one second. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, but I, you're a little fuzzy. Can you repeat oh, what you just said? Yeah. Sure. So in, in the first-time IVF patient group, about one out of six have a displaced window of implantation, so around 15%. Okay. So it's definitely less than the RIF or recurrent implantation failure group, but it still exists within this group. And again, you know, these are our patients, um, you know, who, who have not underwent IVF before. So we really know less about these patients, and maybe an endometrial factor is ultimately their their um, infertility factor. But it does exist in this population. But again, that's one thing I, I do like to focus on is that you know we don't claim that this test is for everyone, and it really has to be utilized properly within the clinic. And the clinic, a lot of times, many clinics will set their their own, um, I guess, criteria for to who to offer this test for. Right, I think that's really important. Do um, so you're in the U.S., but do you know what percentage of, let's say, in the U.S. Um, how many clinics are actually utilizing this test versus ones that are not utilizing this test? That's a really great question. Um, we've definitely seen a, a very sharp increase of the utilization of the test. I can give you, um, I more or less know the global numbers. So at this point in time, we've performed over 55,000 ERA cases worldwide. 
oh, from yeah. over 15, um, 1,500 clinics. So it's, okay. it's very commonly used not just in the U.S. and Canada, but, but elsewhere worldwide, you know, Europe, Australia, Asia, um, South America. Okay. And we're, so what happens? The biopsies are taken from whatever clinic they're at and then they send it to the U.S. then? For testing? So um, all of the uh, samples are sent to um, the, the appropriate affiliate. So all samples in the U.S. are sent here in the U.S. All Canadian samples are sent to our, our laboratory in Montreal and so forth. Oh, okay, okay. All right. So there's a division in Canada, division in, in the U.S. for testing. Okay. But it's not at the local fertility clinic for those are, that are watching. Yeah, so it's only the biopsy portion and the actual um, ERA mock cycle, so, so your standard blood work and ultrasound checks are performed at your clinic, and then the biopsy sample itself will be sent to our laboratory where the analysis will occur. Right, so yeah, so for those, again, who are just joining in, doing the endometrial uh, receptivity, oh my gosh, I can't say it, receptivity, um, testing, you would do a mock cycle, meaning you're not going to go for the embryo transfer. And, you know, I, I see some women, and in fact, today, this woman came in and says, oh my gosh, I only have two precious embryos left. They're frozen. And I'm considering I would like to do ERA. So I said, you have to watch this interview tonight and see if it's for you, because she's had a couple of failed um, transfers, but she's also had a couple of failed IVF retrieval to making no embryo. So to me, I'm like, ooh, is it really the receptivity or is it egg quality, right? So it's hard to say. And it might be both. Um, yeah. What's really interesting, so again, we're very heavily invested in research. Um, this, this past summer at, at the European conference, we um, actually presented our, our pilot study looking at patients who underwent failed euphoria and data transfer. So up until about, I, I think probably two or three years ago, we've always focused in the IVF community on the embryo. It's always, okay, is the embryo good quality? Is the embryo chromosomally normal? And we thought if we have a good quality chromosomally normal embryo, there's no reason why it shouldn't be planned. And when we do see those implantation failures with, you know, quote unquote, like I said before, you could have the perfect embryo and, and transfer, but if the window of implantation isn't open, it's not going to implant. And finally, we're looking at the other the other side of things, which is the endometrium. And for years, we've always treated every woman to be the same, okay, we should have receptivity after five full days of progesterone. But I, I think as, you know, all of medicine's moving towards personalized medicine, um, this is just an example, you know, here in IVF. So anyways, going back to the, the study that we conducted, all of these patients have never had a successful pregnancy despite transferring a chromosomally normal embryo. And when they underwent the EIA test, 73% were found to have a displaced from their implantation, okay. which is to date the highest, you know, displaced group we've seen so far. When we adjusted for the displacement of implantation and transfer the report embryo. So this was the first transfer cycle following the ERA. We had mm -hmm. a 95% cumulative pregnancy rate. So That's awesome. It, it's amazing. I mean, it just mm -hmm. goes to show working together with the embryo and, and endometrium, what can happen. And you, I, I kind of um, you know, bring up an example. You can, if you say plant a flower in poor soil, you probably won't have growth. But when you take care of the soil and the plant, you know, you can have a, 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 a beautiful flower. So it's it's very similar to that. So we think the endometrium is the soil. We have to make sure we have good soil in order to, to produce a, a healthy healthy pregnancy. 100%. And I don't know if you know anything about acupuncture and Chinese medicine, but that's definitely what we espouse. We say we need to cultivate the soil before we plant the seed. And exactly. um, we, we try to do that that by you know increasing blood volume to the uterus um, so when we do frozen embryo transfers and there's some uh, research out there that also talks about 
know, doing acupuncture for months leading up to help that in, um, in, uh, endometrial receptivity. So doing that kind of testing with um, this kind of integrative medicine, I think that's really helpful as well for those that are watching. So thank you for that. Now, I do have one more thing to add, actually two more things. How much does it cost? Because it's an add-on. It is an add-on. So there is a cost to the test itself, um, along with, uh, so, so we have our fees, and then typically the clinic also has their fees. So you have to keep in mind, under if you're utilizing a hormone replacement therapy cycle, you are adding um, estrogen and progesterone. So yeah. those are medications for you to buy, plus the, the cost of the biopsy, and then other fees such as ultrasound and blood work. The ERI test can also be performed in a natural cycle. So this is where the, you would go off the body's own hormones. Mm -hmm. And in that case, um, instead of, of adding progesterone, your body would just make your own progesterone and you would go off that. So in, in those cases, we ask for the biopsy to happen about either a week after you have a natural surge and you ovulate yes. or um, a week after if you're given an HCV trigger shot to, to trigger ovulation. Um, so that can, can probably save money on that end by, by going the natural um, route versus a hormone replacement therapy cycle. So it so with that said, the, the short answer, it would depend on um, from clinic to clinic and cycle type to cycle type. Well, but like, are we talking $1,000, $5,000, $500? For the ERA to add in? So for the add-in, just the ERA, it's less than a thousand. Okay. So right. the prices it differ for Canada and, and US. So I don't know the conversion Canadian dollars versus US dollars. Yeah, a lot more. <laughs> but, <laughs> but anyway, that's another story. We won't talk about that. Um, so my other question, which is actually not about ERA, it's about matrix. Do you know the difference between the two? So with matrix, I'm, I'm honestly, I'm not super familiar with that. It's not a test um, that's used in the United States. But oh. from what I know, yeah, so I, I think right now the, it's being primarily used in Canada. Um, so the important thing is that with the ERI test, it is a genetic test, um, a molecular test. And as I mentioned before, when you have molecular tests, it's, it's more objective. So. Um, you're not just relying on morphology or um, grading from, say, a pathologist or histologist or, or ultrasound technologist in, in that case. So we look at the expression of 248 genes, and we have okay. to think of as endometrial receptivity is quite a complex process. So there's a lot of things that go on in order for receptivity to be obtained. Right. And it would be very difficult to, to understand the complex process by only looking at one aspect of the endometrium, such as you know, ultrasound or, or, like you mentioned before, even endometrial thickness. So by assessing, you know, a, you know many genes, we're able to get a, a better overview of, of receptivity and endometrial health in that way. Um, okay. So it, it is, they are two different tests, so it's very difficult to tell. Totally different. I mean, I, I know that, you know, in matrix, they do it at the same time of the cycle that they're doing the frozen embryo transfer, right? And it is more of an ultrasound and done, I forget, like a couple of days or maybe even a day before, something like that, but it is more of an ultrasound. So um, obviously no genetic testing at all. Um, but I, I'm thinking it's like digging a little deeper than just the thickness of the lining, but I don't know exactly how they do that. I thought maybe you'd have more insight. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't have too much experience. Um, you know, the, again, they're, they're two different tests, so it's very hard to compare. Um, yeah. But I think, as you mentioned, you know, digging a little bit deeper and, and understanding, you know, the more we understand about the endometrium, I think, the more that will help us improve implantation rates with, with IVF in general. Um, so even with our tests, we're, we're actually introducing um, something else, I guess that you can call them an add-on to ERA. Um, so with the, the one biopsy sample received for the receptivity analysis, we can also assess the endometrium for the microbiome and chronic endometritis. So what I'm getting at, the more we learn, 
about this, this complex process in, in dynamic tissue, I think the more we can improve our pregnancy rates and, and kind of you know, help our patients. Again, I think it all comes down to personalized um, medicine. And I, I really think that's going to, to be um, more or less the forefront of IVF. You know, Absolutely. Um, yeah, and I, I really like that it, it should be personalized because everyone responds differently. Everyone has a different body and the scenarios are different. Um, the, the diagnoses are different. So should, we should all be treated differently than doing the exact same protocol. So thank you for adding that in. Thank you for being here. And I know um, our viewers are going to find this very helpful. So please give us a shout out and, and let us know. If there's other questions, please um, email me at... Um, uh, clinic at alive holistic health.ca. Um, unless they also can email you directly, you can offer that up if you'd like. If not, they can ask me and <laughs> and then I'll bug you. <laughs> I'm always very happy to help. Okay, great. Right. Yeah, I totally appreciate it. Um, I want to thank uh, Jessica Fox for contributing with a question, but I think we answered that. So, about uh, where is this type of testing? Uh, in place at this time. So you mentioned it basically all over the world already. So that's awesome. And um, so again, thank you for joining us. And for um, viewers, I just want to thank you for being here. And next week, we'll have another live post. And please scroll down below. We've got a whole whack of different interviews. And on Monday just past, I had an awesome interview with um, Dr. Baratz with regards to fresh versus frozen. And you know, more and more people are definitely going to freezing. And as you say, with ERA, you can't even do it for a fresh cycle anyhow. So that's another indication. Um, so please check them all out. And um, if you don't have Facebook, and if you've been watching this on YouTube, then you can scroll at maryong.life. And I have a whole whack of videos there, same ones converted. And this Sunday, I'm doing a live fertility circle. And I, for those of you who have joined me, um, this will actually be my last one and um, because we're going to make way and make room for creating a new online fertility program that will serve you. And so um, this one will be last and it will be live and we're talking about the fertility mindset and it'll be 90 minutes. You can come on with your Q&A, but I will be training you and uh, teaching and providing very practical advice and tactical advice. So that's this um, Sunday, November 11 at 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. And you can again join through maryong.life, okay? So um, please join me. It'll be freaking awesome. You'll be transformed. And let's get this conversation going and make a difference for you, okay? So have a great night. Thank you again, Tiffany. And uh, perhaps we'll chat later and have you come on and we'll talk more because you'll have other things to share. <laughs> Uh, I, I think so. I would love that. Thank you again for having me. No problem. Okay. Thanks, guys. See you next week. Take care. Bye. Or see you Sunday, hopefully. Bye. <laughs>